Hi, I'm Beckney Berserker, and welcome back to my channel. It's time to dive into the Companion Rules, released in 1984, which ultimately was a game changer. Quite literally, it enabled you to play the game of Dungeons & Dragons in a way that went beyond going on an adventure, broadening its scope to transcend the simple saving of folk and looting of dungeons, to include the potential to carve out territories, conquer lands, run a dominion, and perhaps even one day become a monarch. It wasn't everyone's idea of enjoyable fantasy roleplay, but it was another aspect of the game that was there if you wanted it. In short, if you wanted to rule a land, here were the rules for you to do it. Of course, you may eschew such things in favour of continuing to wander the lands, or even the planes of existence, as an adventurer. The companion rules offered the framework for geopolitical intrigue, and gave players the opportunity to be more influential. As the companion rules state, your adventures will be different than ever before. Lower level characters must keep busy surviving and learning. But when you find the challenges lacking, or treasure too easily found, you may start to wonder, is there anything more? Yes, yes there is. First, I have to warn you that this video was a lot harder to make than others, which is why it's much longer. The reason for this is to cover the differences in play from classic hack and slash D&D. I wouldn't be doing the box set justice if I just skimmed over things and left you wondering what the hell I was talking about. So strap in and let's have a look at the contents. The companion box set is once again adorned by another Elmore dragon that evokes such great imagery. The set reverted back to the two book format of the red box consisting of a player's companion and a dungeon master's companion, with the player's book consisting of just 32 pages and the DM's book totaling 64. The player's companion details progression from levels 15 to 25 for each of the human classes and offers further development for demi-humans in the form of attack ranks, as well as expanded equipment lists and rules for wrestling. However, the bulk of information in this book concerns options available from name level, which is reached at 9th level. If you don't know what name level is, I cover it in my expert rules video, available from the link on the screen or in the description. The book also goes into some detail on demi-human relics, sacred items specific to dwarven, elven and halfling clans, adding depth to these races in both a temporal and spiritual sense. The Dungeon Master's Companion contains the main divergence from classic play, rules for acquiring and ruling dominions, and rules for conducting mass combat. Both rule sets enabling players to enter the world stage and become the movers and shakers of their campaigns, to realise their ambitions, be they for good or ill. The Dungeon Master's Companion also outlines exploration of the multiverse, includes expanded monster and treasure lists, and also supporting information on the demi-human relics mentioned in the Player Companion. So let's have a look at what those player options are in the Player's Companion. What we first notice is that, for human classes, there is heavy emphasis on whether a character is what's termed as a travelling adventurer or a settled one. Although this should not affect things too much in-game, what this aims to establish is the part your adventurer is to play in the world. For instance, a landowning cleric gains power through their church connections, whilst a travelling cleric does not rise through the theocratic hierarchy, but spreads the word, so to speak, through their deeds. Let's step back a bit and take a look at all the human classes and what their options are, from name level. Specifically, how their choice is to be either a settled or travelling adventurer affects their options. I've put this simple table together. As you can see, as well as a cleric choosing to be either settled or travelling, a neutral cleric gains the option to become a new class from 9th level, specifically a druid. I should just speak about that for a moment. To become a druid, the neutral cleric must find a woodland settlement and meditate for one to four months before being found by a high-level druid and tested for worthiness. There's no mention of what this test is, so it may just be background information, or you could make an adventure out of it. At the end of the test, the cleric becomes a druid and has access to druidic spells, whilst losing spells that specifically affect good or evil, such as protection from evil, and they also lose the ability to turn undead. They must also abandon all metal armour and weapons in favour of leather and wooden ones. Furthermore, only 9 druids are said to exist over 30th level, so access to this level may not be gained before defeating one of the 9. There has been some discussion in Beckby groups around why a cleric must wait till 9th level before becoming a druid, and the only real barrier to starting earlier would be the subject of worthiness in the eyes of a high level druid. In the end, nothing is really broken if you wanted to start with a first level druid, although they would be comparatively underpowered. Ultimately, the druid is a class for players who prioritise flavour over ability. It can be fun to play, despite its restrictions, but from my point of view, the class makes a better NPC than anything else. 
So, on to the fighter. As you can see, there are several options. A settled fighter either swears fealty to an existing ruler, or may build in an unclaimed land. I'll cover that more when I come to dominions. As for travelling fighters, they may either remain as they are, or elect to become a specific type of wandering fighter based on their alignment. All fighters can access the option to become a knight, which is the only option available to the neutral fighter. But lawful and chaotic fighters may become what I term as holy or unholy warriors, through the paladin and avenger options. I love the word avenger. Anyway, each option requires aligning to either a lawful or chaotic church, after which the fighter may gain clerical abilities of a level one third of their own, with avengers even being able to control undead. These are clearly attractive options, but players should be wary of tying themselves to the behest of a church, as refusal comes with penalties. You may also notice that fighters who either settle or choose one of the travelling options gain access to fighter combat options, which are otherwise not available to fighters who do not choose any of these paths. As the book states, they require the special study of hand-to-hand -hand combat taught only by knights, paladins and avengers. The fighter options include multiple attacks per round and the smash, parry and disarm manoeuvres. Now let's look at magic users. Magic users appear to have the simplest of options, where they are able to settle and be left alone, with the book stating that most rulers don't want to annoy high-level magic users. However, if a player would prefer to enter into political intrigue, they may attempt to become a magist, that is, an advisor to the local ruler. The travelling magic user option is interesting though, referred to as a magus, in that they may gain rumours of magic and treasure, but also gain quite a strong following of high-level fighters and clerics anything up to 5th level. This might make for an interesting entourage, although they do expect to be paid. When thieves settle, they become a guildmaster of a local thieves guild, and may be first to know about unique adventures they need sorting. A travelling thief is known as a rogue, and although they may not become a guildmaster straight away, they may establish a brand of the guild elsewhere, with the permission of the guildmaster general. Of course, in your campaign, the rogue may go completely rogue, causing inter-guild issues, Anything is up for grabs. Sounds like great potential for fun though. Although not mentioned until the master set, I've also included in this table the mystic, just to emphasise the options available regarding settling. No specific abilities seem to be available for a mystic who is a wanderer. If I've got that wrong, please say so in the comments. So what about demihumans? Well, demihumans may of course continue to adventure as normal, and although they do not gain levels, their experience points should continue to be tracked, as they may increase in what's called attack ranks. As these attack ranks increase, they gain access to fighter combat options at different rates according to class. In addition, demi-humans also benefit from special defences. As you can see here, dwarves gain the ability to automatically reduce spell damage by half, or even a quarter on a successful save. Elves get the ability to have similar resistance, but to breath weapons, and halflings gain resistance to both albeit at different times in their progress. When it comes to demi-human settlements, the companion rules tell of clan relics, which are sacred and sit at the centre of each clan stronghold. A player would have to discuss with their DM how this might work for their own stronghold developments, but essentially they are holy items which can aid in the production of special craft, as shown in this table. It is advised that the player characters have no part in the direct use of relics, due to their power. What one DM chooses to do is of course up to them. So that covers it for the player's companion. All that in just 32 pages. Now let's open the Dungeon Master's companion for the real game changing stuff, starting with Dominions. Your chance to own a corner of the campaign world, manage its income, resources and wealth, and potentially build armies to achieve your aims. When some characters build strongholds, they have the potential to form a Dominion. That is, rule a piece of land that you own. It should be noted that the companion rules assume a fantasy setting loosely based on medieval Europe, but this can be easily modified if needed. We are introduced to five ways of obtaining a dominion, as shown in this table. Founding, land grant, colonisation, enfiefment and conquest. We are then instructed on how to record basic information about it, specifically its size, location, population and resources. The ways to generate these are neatly provided and easy to follow. But so what? What are we to do with this information? What follows is a guide on Dominion administration, which each player with a Dominion would need to do once every game month. 
This is an easy to follow process for recording your Dominion's income and expenditure. This includes tax and resource income and potential spending incurred due to visits from passing nobility. Experience points are gained for a portion of this income, ensuring that Dominion play is rewarded. So before I lose you completely, let's show you an example of a name level fighter obtaining a Dominion. This is Rodney. He has just founded the Barony of Peckham in the wilderness and declared himself the ruler of the surrounding area, overseeing 24 miles of land, which is one hex on the map. The land is unclaimed, so Rodney does not have to swear fealty to anyone. He also attracts 50 followers up to third level, as mentioned in the expert rules when building a stronghold. The rules state that wilderness settlements start with 10 to 100 peasant families per hex, which do not count against Rodney's followers. So Rodney rolls 1d10 and gets 7. Therefore, his newly established barony of Peckham contains 70 peasant families spread across the Dominion. A family is 5 people on average, so the actual population of Peckham is around 350 souls, but it's not really necessary to know this. Now Rodney needs to establish what his Dominion resources are. He rolls 1d10 and gets 8. This equates to 3 resources. He rolls 1d10 3 times, which identify 1 animal resource and 2 mineral. Rodney's player works with the DM to establish what these resources actually are. Let's say horses, silver and tin. That's it in terms of setting up the Dominion to begin with. But after a month, Rodney does the books. He works out his standard income, which is 10 GP per family, which is 700 GP. This is not money, but an abstract representation of the Dominion's wealth and ability to absorb its costs, which might be in the form of visiting nobility or taxes to liege lords or tithes to the church. Tax income, which is real money, is obtained at a rate of 1 GP per family on average. Rodney may set any level of tax he likes, but it may affect the confidence his people have in him. I'll come on to this bit in a minute. For now, Rodney sticks to 1 GP per family and gains 70 GP in tax. Rodney then works out his resource income, which the rules state is 2 GP per family for every animal resource and 3 GP per family for every mineral resource. This equates to 560 GP. Rodney's total income for the month is 1,330 gold pieces, and the player is now able to work out how many experience points they get, which is the total of just the revenue and tax income, which are the real money elements. This is 560 plus 70, which equals 630 experience points. Maybe not a huge amount, but it's early days, and Rodney has ambitions for his dominion to grow. Before determining the next month's income, Rodney must work out whether his population has grown. The rules state that the growth for a dominion with 1 to 100 families is 25%. This may be due to attracting new people to the area as well as births. In addition, each hex in Rodney's barony, just the one for now, will gain and lose 1d10 families due to things like weather, harvests, etc. Rodney's player rolls 2d10 and gets a 7 and an 8. Therefore, the 70 families increase by 25% to 88, then grow by 7 and decrease by 8, leaving a total of 87 families living under the fair rule of Baron Rodney of Peckham. Now, I know what you're thinking. How on earth is this fun? Well, in actual fact, this section of play is what happens between games. Groups didn't meet up to do bookkeeping. This was done in the margins of the wider campaign. Your characters would still be able to adventure occasionally, by installing some kind of administration in your absence. I mean, pillaging dungeons and dragon hordes is still the best way to obtain cash. So if the Barony of Peckham wants to expand quickly, then Rodney needs to take to the road occasionally. In addition to the monthly activity in managing a dominion, there is the annual confidence check, which determines how satisfied your people are with you and whether they still pay their taxes, and the check for natural and unnatural events, which could have an impact on your population's confidence. It all seems like a paper-based sim, and that's because it is. This was being played out in many Beckme campaigns way before the Civilization or SimCity games were even a thing, and impacted on the geopolitical backdrop of many campaigns. CM1, The Test of the Warlords by Douglas Niles, was an official introductory module for players wanting the opportunity to gain territory in a land grab situation, and a great primer for anyone wanting to explore this kind of play with a mix of adventure as well. So let's move on to the mass combat system that was referred to as the War Machine. Once you had the Dominion, 
How are you going to build an army and expand it? Or even if you didn't have a dominion, how can you play out the outcome of potential invasions from marauding orcs? The War Machine took up only six pages of the Dungeon Master's Companion, detailing rules for how to determine the strength of a force depending on their number, training and equipment, as well as their type. There were four steps to this. The first was to work out the basic force rating, or BFR, which was dependent on its leadership, experience, training, equipment, and whether it was comprised of any special troops, such as undead. The BFR is then carried forward to determine the troop class, which can be anything from untrained to elite. The higher the BFR, the closer you are to being an elite force. The third step is to determine the force's battle rating based on the number of mounted troops, missile using troops, magic using troops, etc. Once the battle racing is determined, it's time for war. When two forces meet, environmental issues, troop ratios and morale elements come into play, amongst other things, which send your battle rating up or down. Once all the calculations are made, the final battle ratings are known. A combat roll is then made by both players with a D percentile and their results are added to the respective modified battle ratings. The player with the highest result wins. It's as simple as that, but to determine the win-loss statistic, the loser's role is taken from the winner's result, and this number is cross-referenced on the combat results table. You can see it here. So for instance, if the difference is 60, the winner loses 20% of their troops compared to 50% for the loser, they are moderately fatigued compared to the loser being seriously fatigued, and they may advance into enemy terrain, with the loser forced into a significant retreat. The War Machine system was an elegant way of bringing mass combat into D&D while still making it fun. The rules state that player characters are never lost due to the combat results, as these should be handled individually, which is sensible, and can make for some heroic passages of play whilst chaos ensues around you. There is also the possibility to add tactics to mass combat, with the players choosing a certain approach to the battle, such as full attack or an envelope manoeuvre. There is also the opportunity to use intelligence gathered, or surprise. These modify the battle rating before the combat roll, to swing the result one way or the other. These tactics add a bit more tension to how the results might be modified, and things can get a little bit tense just before the combat roll. Ultimately, the War Machine facilitates the resolution of mass combat, but it also helps determine the battle force rating of a standing army of a Dominion, such as Baron Rodney's. He has some way to go, but his 50 followers need to keep fit and equipped if they are to resist incursions from bandits. And who knows, one of Rodney's scouts spotted a settlement about 50 miles away that looked like the troops were getting fat and lazy. You can see where this can go. By managing your Dominion's battle force rating improves its survival and expansion prospects. It's all part of the companion level game. And what's more, it gives the game a point to having gold. Gold can enable you to expand your territory, your administration, your armies. The rules for strongholds, dominions and armies demonstrate a point to wealth and power better than any other version of D&D in my opinion. There has to be a point going after all that loot. Right, so we've covered the dominions and the war machine. The next part of the Dungeon Master's Companion is just three pages on advice on how to run adventures in the multiverse, such as the Elemental Planes and the Ethereal Plane. There are also detailed explanations on how certain spells behave in these planes, and how characters might move in them and navigate through them, including how they might be reached using vortexes and wormholes. And finally, there is 15 pages of monsters, including the Beholder, and 16 pages of new magical items, before we are offered three scenarios to help implement the new systems we have encountered. These comprise of a tournament scenario including jousting rules, a gladiatorial scenario to practice the wrestling rules, and an invasion scenario against the infamous Black Eagle Barony to practice the war machine. Honestly, after getting through all of this, I have to take my hat off to Frank Mensah for getting so much content in such a tight word count. The rules might be thought of as complicated, but the way they are written make them so easy to understand. I read the rules again before doing this video and it was so easy compared with sometimes struggling through modern Wizards of the Coast material. So please don't be put off by my lengthy video. I believe it's well worth your time to dive into the companion rules to expand your Beckme game to the next level, or any old school game that you may be playing. Thank you for getting this far. Please like and subscribe as it really helps me grow my channel. If you think I deserve more thanks then please consider buying me a coffee, link in the description.
These videos do take considerable time to make, so any support is appreciated. I'm Bake Me Berserker, and I hope you enjoyed this walk through the companion rules, and I hope to see you back here soon.